We praise the Lord and Shalom everyone. Welcome to class. Welcome to all the online students, our in-person students, and also to our e-learning students who will be listening to these lectures later on. Hope all of you had a good weekend and are ready refreshing for another week. Okay, we'll uh, continue our study on uh, the kingdom of God. We uh, we'll be looking, uh, we'll continue looking at kingdom thinking and then we'll uh, begin looking at kingdom living chapter five. So we'll begin um, with the word of prayer. Can one of the online students please? Um, the mic is ready. Okay. Okay. Can one of you please, uh, online students, anyone can unmute your mic and pray, please? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Chira. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful morning, Lord. I thank you for the new day in our life, my Father. I thank you for all the grace you've given us, my Lord. As we're going to start our class, my Father God, help us to understand more from your word, my Father God. Help us to know you more through this uh, lecture my father god and lord help uh, our men and give her more wisdom and more revelation that she's teaching us my father whatever she's teaching us my father god lord i thank you for all the students my father god and i thank you for all faculties in the name of jesus i pray amen 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 thank you Chira. okay so um last week we were looking at kingdom thinking okay i hope you were you put into action kingdom thinking chira can you please uh, mute your mic thank you okay i hope you were uh, doing some kingdom thinking contemplating on your own thinking okay practicing kingdom thinking right okay uh, before we finished um, uh, last class, we were uh, we, we looked at Matt, Mark chapter ten, verses seventeen to thirty one, and this uh, the eye of a needle, and I think Nina Santosh read it for us. Um, we also uh, have the same similar passage in Matthew chapter nineteen, verses sixteen to thirty. Okay. So what is basically Jesus trying to say about kingdom thinking in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31? Anyone? What is Jesus trying to say about kingdom thinking in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31? <laughs> What is he challenging us about? Okay, what about our thinking he's challenging? What area of life is he challenging us? Riches, wealth, okay, and money, okay? And what does Jesus say? Those who have riches, it's difficult and hard for them to enter and experience the kingdom of God. Okay. And so does it leave that person with riches, you know, with no hope? No, what does he say? Yes, thank you. And he says, he, yet he assures us with God, all things are possible. What does it mean? God can, do anything. God can do anything. Yes, I know God can do anything. But what does it mean in this context? In this context of a rich man, those who are with riches, you know, God is saying that it's hard for them to uh, enter and experience the kingdom of God. But then he does not leave them without any hope. There is some assurance. So what is the assurance he's giving them? God is Yes, with God, everything is possible. But what is the possibility here? Yeah. He's, he's, uh, God is implying that, you know, that he will see, it implies here that God is saying, you know, that those who are rich in this world will have the necessary grace. Grace for what? Even though they are rich, you know, uh, to 
you see their riches as tools that can be used to enhance and further and build the kingdom of God. Okay, so he'll give them the grace to, um, you know, allow them to use their wealth uh, for the right reason, for the right purpose, and will prevent uh, the riches from keeping them from entering into the kingdom of God. Okay, so he says that the love for wealth and riches can keep people away from the kingdom, can keep people away from experiencing the kingdom of God. But Jesus is saying that those who adopt kingdom thinking, okay, those who love the king and his kingdom far more than the wealth and the riches that God has given to them, you know, will consider these as just basically tools or some blessing that God has given to them uh, to honor the king, to serve the king and his kingdom, okay? And it, this will not be allowed to be a hindrance from them experiencing the kingdom. I was just imagine if, if, if it says, if Jesus says, you know, it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heavens. Some of us may not even... Be, you know, be able to enter or experience the kingdom of, sorry, not some of us, all of us, <laughs> you know. So he's not a God who wants us to be poor and, you know, famished in things, but he wants us to be rich in every area of our lives, okay, even in the area of wealth. But he will give us the grace to see our riches and to use it as tools to, you know, to honor the king and how can we honor the king to enhance and build the kingdom of God. Okay. So just coming to the last part of uh, this lesson, it says more than the outward form. Uh, can one of you please read Matthew chapter 5 verse 20? <clears throat> And and is the mic on, Nikhil? Okay. okay, thank you. So here it says, uh, the Lord Jesus was very strongly addressing the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Okay, and he is very strongly rebuking them, very sternly he's rebuking them. Um, and he says in uh, chapter Matthew chapter 21, verse 32, that even tax collectors and harlots will enter the kingdom of God ahead of the Pharisees, okay? So here, why is he so strongly addressing the, or very sternly he's addressing the uh, hypocrisy of the Pharisees, okay? We look at uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 13, Jesus says that the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees we're hindering others from entering the kingdom of heaven. So that is why he's very stern. That is why he's very strong with them. Why? Because the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees are hindering them from entering the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Now, the problem with the Pharisees was what? What was the main problem with the Pharisees? Why does he call them a hypocrite? Yes, they're not living what... The word or not living the law, they are just showing it with outward uh, appearance. Okay, uh, they in fact they tell others what to do and they do not practice it themselves. Okay, so that was a problem with most of the Jews. They were telling others, "Hey, you need to keep the law. You need to keep the circumcision ritual." Even after they become, you know, believers, it was a problem that Paul addresses in most of his letters in the early church. You know, uh, these Jews who became Christians, who became believers, you know, they wanted the Gentiles to keep the law, to keep the rituals, to keep the uh, sacred days, uh, to keep the circumcision ritual, which is a sign of the covenant. And, um, you know, Paul is, well, is also tells them in Romans chapter uh, 2 and chapter 3, he says, you know, you who judge others, you yourself are breaking the law. Okay, then how much more you will be judged. So here he's saying, you know, in Matthew chapter 23, verses 3 and 4, Jesus says the problem with the Pharisees is they don't practice what they're telling others to do. Okay? And whatever they did, why did they do it? To show people and to get praise from men. 
Okay. So uh, Jesus is actually challenging um, us to have a lifestyle that goes beyond the lifestyle or the thinking or the culture of the scribes and the Pharisees. And then he says, only then can you experience the kingdom of heaven. Okay. So the kingdom of heaven cannot just be experienced in outward form. Why? Because the kingdom of God is inside us and it translates from inside out. Okay. From inward to the outward. Okay. So that is why there should be a transformation of the heart and mind before there is a transformation in our lifestyle in the way that we uh, live. Okay. So kingdom thinking is not enough just to have the right knowledge, the right teaching, okay, the right intentions. Uh, it must be translated into action. Only if you have the right thinking, the right intentions, the right motives, it will be translated, the right desires, it will be translated into the actions that you show or you live. Okay. So we must live by what we know and um, what we teach. Okay, so that is what he is challenging the Pharisees, and that is what Jesus is also challenging us. That you know, we might have the right knowledge, we might have the right teaching, we have the word of God with us, we have the right intentions, but all of that has to translate into action. Okay, so our actions actually show us whether we are kingdom citizens, we are king doing kingdom thinking, king having the kingdom culture, kingdom lifestyle. Okay, so that is uh, about chapter four. Uh, in conclusion, you know, the kingdom of God is so different from the way that we are. Just the kind of summing up, you know, or doing a recap of all that we looked at even um, last week. The kingdom of God is very different from the way that we are used to, that we are accustomed to. It's different from the culture of this world, but we need to train our Selves and we need to adapt ourselves to kingdom culture and kingdom thinking. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Okay. So first of all, change our thinking. And how can we change our thinking? We need to think from a kingdom perspective. Okay. Develop a kingdom thinking in our life um, where you're learning to say, hey, that, you know, that my standard is much higher than the standard of this world. Okay. And you're saying, I'm not just trying to fit in the norm. I'm not just trying to fit here the standards of this world. But I'm living a greater and a bigger standard. I'm living the kingdom standards, which are much, much higher. Why? Because I belong to the kingdom. And when I belong to a kingdom, what is the norm in the kingdom of God? Love is the norm. That's the first thing that we looked at, right, last week. Okay, it's not normal for us to retaliate evil for evil. Okay, but it is normal as kingdom citizens to to return evil for good. Okay, so we also see that in the kingdom of God, it's normal to see things to the eyes of faith. Yes. Okay, to see things to the eyes of faith, to see things um, in the invisible, see the impossibilities becoming possibilities that's what we saw okay faith sees mountains like small speck of dust before the almighty god so whatever is our giant whatever is our mountain it's a very small speck of dust you know the small speck of dust you know on this floor there's a lot of dust actually we can't see it okay why because it's 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 so small compared to the the other, you know, the, the, the surroundings that is there around us, okay? So our faith, when we look at our giants or our mountains, will be like a small speck in front of the almighty God. And also faith sees a doorway when there is no way, when there is no door. Uh, faith sees the doorway, okay? And because we're looking at things from a kingdom perspective, we're thinking from a kingdom perspective. Also, we saw that in the kingdom of God, it's also worthy to lose your life for the king's sake, for the kingdom's sake, and for the gospel. And then we looked at the kingdom of God is made up of people who are childlike, okay? Not childish, but people who are childlike, 
Okay, so child likeness characterizes the people who belong to the kingdom of God, which means that the king in the kingdom of God, we just implicitly just trust the father. Okay, we just depend completely on God, we just abandon ourselves completely in the arms of the father, just like the child abandons themselves in the uh, uh, hands of their parents just to be loved and cared and um, taken care of. Okay. We also saw that in the kingdom of God, servanthood is a pathway for what? Servanthood is a pathway to go up to greatness. Okay. It's a willingness to be insignificant. Okay. Willingness to be small, insignificant. And willingness to be insignificant is the first qualification to become great. Okay. And we also saw that in the kingdom of God, we always celebrate what the king or the father is doing in the lives of others. He will do just as he pleases. Okay. And um, so even as we looked at all of these kingdom thinking, just basically just did a small brief recap. Now, I want to challenge us to have uh, this kind of kingdom thinking, okay? So if all of us begin to think this way and live this way and have this kind of culture, you know, um, imagine the kind of culture that we'll have in our church. Imagine the kind of culture that we'll have in our community. Imagine the kind of culture you'll have in Bible college as well. Okay, imagine the kind of culture you have in the boys' hostel, the girls' hostel, in our homes, uh, in our relationships. The culture will be so different in our church, in our community, in our families, wherever we are um, in living. Okay, and I also want to not only just challenge us uh, to kingdom thinking, but also want to encourage us to read the rest of the gospels. You know, even as we're doing the kingdom of God, read the gospels, read the teachings of Jesus, because. That forms the basis for our kingdom thinking and our kingdom uh, culture. That's when we will begin looking at things from a kingdom perspective. It's important to, for us to keep reading and rereading and keep on um, reading. Okay. Uh, in this chapter, we just touched a handful of things, you know, from from uh, Jesus te teaching about uh, kingdom thinking in the Gospels. But there's a lot more in the New Testament. So just like us all to read, assimilate, you know, just create a framework in which to think, in which to act, in which to behave, so that you will begin to look at things from a kingdom perspective. Okay. Any questions on chapter four before we move on to chapter five? Any questions? Kingdom thinking? Online students, anyone has any questions? No questions? Okay. Then no questions. We'll move on to Colossians, uh, to chapter. <laughs> we'll move on to chapter five, kingdom living. I'm just jumping so fast. Okay. Um, to chapter five, kingdom living. Okay. And I like one of us to read Colossians chapter one, verses 12 and 13. It's not there in your, uh, in, in the publication, but I like you all to read that, please. Colossians chapter one, verses 12 and 13. Go ahead, just somebody read. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the heaven. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His Lord. Okay, so here what does Jesus say? He says, We who believe in Jesus have been taken out from where? Darkness. The kingdom of? darkness and we've been put into the kingdom of, kingdom of jesus christ okay uh look at john chapter 18 verse 36 john chapter 18 verse 36 can somebody read that it's not there in your in the publication as well but it's like you have to read john chapter 18 verse 36 john chapter 18 verse 36 jesus answered my kingdom is not of this world if my kingdom were of this world my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from 
Amen. So Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So you and I are not, are not part of this world, but we are part of the kingdom of God that is not of this world. Okay. We are part of the kingdom that's out of this world. And that is, uh, so if it's out of this world, it is a heavenly kingdom, which means it comes from heaven. So what are we trying to say? Much of the stuff that we see in the world, you know, does not belong to us or we are not part of it because we don't really belong to this world. We've come from a different world. We belong to the kingdom of heaven. So much of the things that we see in this world actually does not or we are not part of that because we do not belong to this world. Okay. So as kingdom people, our lifestyle is, should be very, very different. Okay. And hence we call it as kingdom living. Okay? We live according to the kingdom of heaven and not according to the kingdom of this um, world. So most of what we do as believers, you know, our lifestyle is very, very different and should be different. Okay. Tell your neighbor your lifestyle should be different. <laughs> Okay, now, uh, of course, there are some similarities that we have in this world. Okay, we wear the same clothes, we eat the same food, you know, we live in the same planet, but yet our living is different because we are part of the kingdom of God and not of this world. Okay, look at Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Now, uh, when he was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, but indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. Okay, so Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And they kind of misunderstood the whole message that Jesus was teaching about the kingdom uh, that he had come to inaugurate. You know, Jesus had come to inaugurate the kingdom of God. So they thought what he was talking was a physical kingdom. Okay. They thought that he's going to bring in a literal physical kingdom where he is going to come and establish his rule and reign which means he's going to have the Jews free, you know, free from all the Roman rule, Roman subjection. And they, they're going to be independent people. So here is this king who's coming and he's establishing a physical uh, kingdom. But what was Jesus, what kind of kingdom Jesus was talking about? He was talking about a spiritual kingdom. He was not talking about a physical kingdom. So they were misunderstanding what Jesus was uh, saying and so they were not able to comprehend they were not able to understand so they were you know um, they asked Jesus what is the sign of your kingdom mm -hmm. so how does a kingdom or they were asking Jesus how does the kingdom of God come how do we know that the kingdom of God has come in our midst how do we know that the kingdom of God is around here so actually the the Jews or the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes they were looking for a king. They were looking for somebody who would come on a horse, you know, with a crown, with a big sword, and, you know, with all that fanfare and, you know, kind of uh, liberate the Jews and have them as a whole nation and they would come back into um, power because they had this mindset, you know, um, ours is the fourth. The forefathers is ours, ours is the covenants, ours is the law, uh, or ours is the promises that are given to us, and everything belongs to us. So we are a, like a kind of a superior race, you know. And here they were under the subjection of the Roman government, which they did not like, and they were looking for the Messiah. So when Jesus came as the Messiah, it was the Kairos moment because the Jews were more than before looking for the Messiah. But the Jews, missed, uh, you know, they were looking for more of a king who would come and have a physical kingdom. And they were, and Jesus had come to inaugurate the spiritual kingdom. He was a Messiah who came to die for the sins. And so there was a total um, misunderstanding. 
um, you know, and uh, and Jesus was preaching about the kingdom and uh, he was preaching about the spiritual kingdom. And so he responds to them in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and uh, 21. For, and Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. So he was, when he was saying the kingdom of God is within you, he's basically making a statement. He's saying, look, the kingdom that I'm talking about is not about the externals. It's not about this king coming on the horse with a crown and, you know, with a sword and he's going to, you know, bring deliverance and you are going to be free and all of those things. It's not about externals, but it's a spiritual kingdom. It's something that works from inside out. It's something that works from within you. Okay. So as believers, we too need to understand that the kingdom of God is within us. So what is what do we mean when the kingdom of God is within us? Of course, we said, you know, when the kingdom of God is within us, our thinking will translate. But in this context about kingdom living, what do we mean when we say the kingdom of God is within us? Okay, in our actions. Okay. It's not about just talking and teaching, but it's about living. Okay. When we say the kingdom of God is within us, it is. It means that wherever we go, the kingdom is there. Okay. Wherever we go, we are releasing the kingdom there. Okay. Whichever place you go, you are releasing the kingdom there because it is within us. We are carrying the kingdom within us. We're carrying the kingdom authority. We're carrying the kingdom power. We are carrying the kingdom's um, rule and reign. We're carrying the kingdom's presence. We're carrying the king, the king's name, uh, his authority. So wherever we are going, the kingdom of God is there in our midst. That's why wherever Jesus went, the kingdom was seen through him. Okay. He, uh, he exhibited the rule, the reign, the, the presence, the authority, the power, um, and the name of the, uh, the father that he uh, identified with, that he assembled. So wherever Jesus went, whether it was in the temple, it was in the marketplace, it was in the, the a place where pe sick people were there, the pool of Bethesda, it was in the mountain, wherever he went, he carried the kingdom because the kingdom is within us and it, it comes from uh, within us it comes from inside out so jesus said you know hey I, what i'm talking about is a, is a spiritual kingdom sorry it's a spiritual kingdom and it comes from inside out so so the kingdom lifestyle is just like that it's outworking of the kingdom of god that is within us it is the outworking of the kingdom of god that is inside us and it affects our lifestyle if it affects the way that we live, okay? So what are the characteristics of kingdom lifestyle? We're going to be looking at some of the characteristics of kingdom lifestyle, just like we looked at some of the characteristics of kingdom living or the, you know, the framework in which we need to think. We're also going to look at some of the characteristics of kingdom lifestyle. So what are the characteristics of kingdom lifestyle? What do you think is the characteristics of kingdom lifestyle? Don't have to look in your book. Can we have some answers even from our online students? What are some of the characteristics of kingdom lifestyle? Righteousness. Righteousness. Holiness. Peace. Enjoy. And joy. Holiness. 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 Okay, holiness. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Love. Love, yes. Our lifestyle and courage should be different from us. Yes, how can it be different? That's what they said, holiness, righteousness, peace, joy, love, forgiveness. What else? Power authority. <laughs> Thank you for looking in the book. Uh, power authority and dominion. What else? What else is kingdom lifestyle? Our online students, are you there? Yes, humility. Faith. Servanthood. Okay. What else? Good conduct. good conduct, endurance, you know, willing to go through persecution and suffering, stewardship. Okay, Jack and Joel says meekness and gentleness. Yes, very, very important.
characteristic uh, traits of uh, kingdom culture and kingdom living is meekness and gentleness. You know, Sri Radha says being faithful. Yes. Okay. So uh, let's look at some of the characteristics of kingdom living. In, um, you know, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul, uh, you know, describes to us or basically contrasts people of the kingdom and people of this world. And he draws a very clear separation. He, he draws a very clear distinction between these two in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18. So can somebody please read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18, please? Chapter 6, 14 to 18. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteous with lawlessness? And what communion has right with darkness? And what accord, what accord has Christ with Bilal. Bilal. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Okay, amen. So here, many times, you know, the scripture passage is used in what context usually? Marriage. Marriage, yes. The first thing when you go to your pastor and says, you know, you tell your pastor, I want to marry so-and-so. What's the first question your pastor will ask? Is she a believer? Is she or he a believer? Okay. So uh, so this whole passage, and if, if it, the person is not, then the pastor will basically open up to, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18. And this is something we also teach all our young people. Okay. Uh, so this passage is basically used for, you know, when you want to get married. Um, mm -hmm. But this passage has an application, of course, in the context of marriage, but that's not the only reason that this, you know, uh, Paul is writing this, or it's only in this context of marriage that he's writing. It has to do with everything concerning our lives here on earth. It has to do with every area concerning our lives here on uh, earth. So these verses hold true for every area, for every facet of our life. Uh, so God is saying, you know, you're a believer, and as a believer, you've got no communion, no fellowship with darkness. Why? Because you are in, you are a light, you belong to the kingdom of God, you are in Christ. And hence you've got no fellowship with Bilal, okay, which is another title for Satan. Or it's simply the word Bilal means worthless or, you know, it's another word for Satan. So you, you have no connection with Satan because you are a child of God, you're part of the kingdom of uh, God, okay? So you're, you're righteous and hence you have no fellowship with unrighteousness. You know, if you don't fellowship with, you know, if you don't fellowship with the world, then what is going to happen? Your heavenly father is going to be proud of you and he's happy to call you as his sons and his daughters, okay? Now, this does not mean that we totally disconnect from the world. It means that, yes, we know that there is a distinction, okay? And that distinction becomes very, very evident even as we live our lives here on earth, okay? Look at uh, John chapter 3, verses 19 to 21, okay? Can somebody read that? John chapter 3, verses 19 to 21. Can somebody read that, please? John chapter 3, verse 19 to 20. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were in it. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, 
that they have been meant for God. According to what God wants us to do. Okay. So John is writing here and he's saying that we know that the light has come into the world. And what who's the light that he's referring to? Jesus Christ. But he says, even though the light has come into the world, men love darkness because why do the men love darkness? Their deeds are evil. So why do they love darkness? Yes, to hide their evil deeds because when light comes, it shows everything is very evident. Everything is very, very uh, clear. Okay. So he says, whoever practices evil, they don't like the light because they don't want, you know, the light to expose all of the evil things that they're doing or the evil deeds that they are indulging in or they are doing. But he who does the truth, you know, loves the light or wants to come to the light or live in the light because their deeds can be clearly seen as what they're doing is good or what they're doing is according to the will of God or what they're doing is holy and pleasing and acceptable in God's sight. So John says that men love darkness. Men means men and women. Okay. Men and women love darkness rather than light and they prefer staying in the darkness so that their deeds are not exposed. So what's the point here? What is the point we're trying to say? Connecting this to kingdom living. We should come to the light. We should do the right things. We should live in the light. Okay. So we should should have the holiness, okay? So I should have that holy faith. Our perspective should be from that kingdom. I think you need to take the mic, otherwise, uh, you know, the our online students will not be able to hear. It's okay. You can go ahead, Nina. Hmm. So, the kingdom perspective, like we should have uh, that, uh, do things of uh, God, which is holy mm -hmm. uh, and righteousness, okay, right thing before. Okay. So even as people love darkness, their deeds are bad, we are living where? We're living in this world, but we're living not, or we, li we live off this world, even though we are living in the world, which means we exhibit kingdom culture, kingdom thinking, kingdom lifestyle. And we are amongst the people who are, you know, love darkness because their deeds are evil. And if they don't see the light, you know, they won't have, they won't know the difference between light and darkness. They'll be so used to, they'll be so accustomed to the darkness. Okay. So that's why Jesus says, we are the light of the world. Okay. He calls us as salt and light. We are the light of the world. Okay. So when we live the way God wants us to live, you know, uh, people will be able to clearly see the light of the gospel, the truth of the gospel. Uh, they were able to clearly see Jesus Christ in and through us. And hence, it's important for us to be light here in the <laughs> darkness. But we need to also be careful that we don't fellowship with darkness, right? Sometimes we have good intentions. Uh, we want to be among people who love darkness. We want to be people uh, uh, who are living in sin. Because we want to reach out to them, we want to build bridges with them, we want to be with them, and it's a good intention, right? And we must do it. But in the process, if we if we lose, you know, or we compromise, or we give in, and we do things that are wrong, then we fail to be that light. You know, we are losing out on our calling. And that is very, very sad that many, you know, many of us as believers, as Christians, you know, we have failed to be that salt and that light. We begin as salt and light, but we fail to walk and be that light and salt in this um, world, okay? And hence, when we do that, we are compromising and we are not being pleasing to the Father. And it's so sad sometimes when you see believers go away from the truth 
go away from the work, go away from living righteous lives. You know, uh, just two two weeks back, you know, just listening to two um, people that I know very well who was so strong in their faith, in their walk with God. You know, um, just compromising their their stance, their ethical, their moral life. And when I heard it, I was just too shocked because I could not believe that it is these two people. And I was just so grieved and so hard and uh, so pain in my heart. And I was just thinking, you know, how how much God must be so grieved and pained in just looking at them, you know, how they would have broken the heart of God, how they would have quenched the spirit, how they would have grieved the spirit. But then I quickly moved on to this thought, you know, hey, you know, don't, uh, you know, you also need to be very careful about how you work out your salvation. So it came back to me saying that you be careful. You know, you're looking at looking at other people and saying so sad, how terrible, how bad, how God's heart must be grieved. But you need to be so much more careful that you can even just make one mistake and break the heart of God. You can go away. Just that sin that knocks at your door, you know, that's waiting to, uh, you know, to take a uh, devour you and, you know, but, you know, you need to be so much more careful. And I, and then I just cried out to God and say, God, you know, in every little aspect of my life, whether in the secret, uh, in my, the quiet depths of my heart, my thoughts, my motives, my passions, my desires, God, please consecrate me, show me if there's any sin, show me if there is anything that I'm doing, because that can be such a small opening, but can lead to sin so you know it actually brought me to a place of greater fear and living in greater fear and reverence and holiness before god because thinking that when these two people can happen to them and they can go away from their faith you know what about me you know so how much more i need to be accountable how much more i need to live my life how much more i need to be in the presence of god and ask god to sanctify and cleanse and wash me so you know it's it's a it's a powerful reminder for all of us you know when we see people you know we need to be reminded that we can also fall we can also go away and just one little thing can take us away from the truth and uh you know stop us from being the salt and light when we compromise with the things of this um world and when we're not pleasing to the father okay so paul is very clear about this when he's writing his epistles uh, to the church at Corinth, to the church at Galatia and, and, and Ephesus, when he's writing Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians, uh, and all the believers that he's writing to, Paul is very clear. Uh, it, he's very clearly indicating that sinful lifestyle is unacceptable before God, and that will prevent or that will stop you from entering and experiencing the kingdom of God. And he was so strong in his, you know, understanding about the kingdom of God and who would inherit the kingdom of God. So now just looking at Paul when he's writing all of these things, you know, how much more he must be holding himself accountable, how much more he must be spending time with God, how much more he must be crying out to God for holiness and sanctification because somebody who is a great apostle, somebody who's written all of these, you know, he could have also fallen, right? He could have also gone away from the truth. He could have also lived an immoral life and done things that are displeasing after writing all of these things. And all of his works would have been so worthless. But, you know, like a, 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 as a Paul, you know, a, a model, just like Jesus, you know, when we look up, uh, we can see that not only just doing and not only teaching, but also practicing and living. So, so important um, for us. So he's very strong, you know, in these episodes when he's writing to the churches in these three churches, his understanding about the kingdom of God and who would inherit the kingdom of God. So, for instance, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9, 10. Before that, I'd like to read what Nina John says. The, the kingdom is also God's present rule in the lives of his people. The dynamic new life in Christ showing itself in a humble life dedicated to Christ and his church. Yes. Thank you, Nina. That's quite profound and <laughs> good. Thank you. Yeah, can somebody read First Corinthians chapter six, verses nine and ten, please? Six, nine, and ten. Do you not know that the unrighteous, unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Will not be deceived. 
neither fornicators nor adulterators nor idolaters nor adulterators nor homosexuals nor sodomites nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So. Paul is talking here about the kingdom of God. In that context, he's saying, listen, you know, don't fool yourselves. You know, if you continue in unrighteousness, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he talks about all of these things. He talks about fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous people, <coughs> drunkards, you know, uh, revelers, extortioners. And he says all of these Will not uh, you know enter the kingdom of god he also mentions the same uh, thing in uh, galatians chapter 5 verses 19 to 21. he also lists out several things there he calls and he calls it as a work of the flesh okay and he talks about things like jealousy anger hatred imagine some of these things we think is is okay right normal jealousy is okay we think we think anger is Okay, we think hatred is okay, but he says, you know, this these are all things of the flesh. And he says, those who practice these things, meaning those who continue in this, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he's writing to whom? He's writing to believers, he's writing to the churches in these areas. Okay. And the same thing he repeats in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, where he's talking about fornication, all kinds of un cleanliness is even talking about foolish talk and coarse jesting okay that means sometimes we indulge in just foolish talk you know uh, you know making some jokes that are that are dirty you know but we think it's okay and we all laugh at it okay but he's even saying those kind of things are you know is displeasing and unrighteous and he says, those who de do these things do not have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So once again, he's talking to believers. So what is he basically saying in these three, you know, scripture passages? He's telling believers, you know, I know you've received, you know, I know you're saved by grace, but yet I am telling you, you cannot practice these things. Okay. Because if you practice these things, this is not part of kingdom living. This is not part of kingdom culture. And if you practice these things, what is he saying? Let me tell you up front, straight away, on your face, you know, what, what does he say? Those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. And so, you know, some we can we can tell Paul, hey Paul, you know, all along. You know, the, the believers in churches could have also asked Paul this question. We can also think, hey, Paul, you know, all along we thought that we are saved by grace through faith. And uh, so where, where does works come in? All of these are works, right? But we are saved by grace through faith. So what do you think Paul's answer is? What do you think he'll tell you? <laughs> Can you take the mic, please? Uh, before that, Nina has a question. It says a list of people mentioned in First Corinthians chapter six, verses nine and ten. If they are able to come out of it, can they inherit the kingdom? Yes. If they are able to come out, they can surely inherit the kingdom of God, because we have a God who is gracious, forgiving, and He is not somebody who condemns us and leaves us in our sin and forgets about us. He's somebody who works in us so that we can come to repentance and forgiveness. And it's referring to people who continue in these practices who cannot inherit. Yes. Those who continue in these practices cannot uh, inherit. Yes. Yeah. So what was my question? We have to live a holy life, okay? We are saved by grace through faith, uh, through faith then what, what are works having to do with our salvation? So we'll come back after the break and look, after, uh, look at that, okay? Thank you. What about...